Um, I'm here up on the stage. My name is Dan Clays. I'm editor at Slate. I edit the culture section at Slate. Um, uh, and I'm here with the lovely and talented Linda Berry. Um, I have a very short introduction that I'm going to read about her because some of you, I think actually probably they know who you are. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, Linda Berry was born in Wisconsin and grew up in Seattle and now she lives in Wisconsin again. Um, for nearly 30 years, her comic strip, Ernie Pook's Comic, appeared in alt-weeklies across the country. When I profiled Linda for the New York Times Magazine in 2011, she was already finding a huge amount of personal satisfaction in teaching creativity and storytelling workshops aimed at, in her words, non-writers like bartenders, janitors, office workers, hairdressers, musicians, and anyone who has given up on being a writer but still wonders what it might be like to write. Since then, Linda has started teaching every semester. Every semester, right? I, uh, now I'm actually full-time, yeah. Linda is now a full-time benefits-receiving faculty at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and she has, still teaches elsewhere in her new book, Syllabus Notes, there it is, uh, Notes from an Accidental Professor comes out next month from Geron and Quarterly. Everyone, please give it up for Linda Berry. Thank you. So I have so many things I want to talk to you about, Linda, but first I want you to tell everyone here about Marilyn Fresca. Oh, um, so I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, um, which was a, uh, and it was right after. Someone just whistled. There's one fellow well, we, alumnus here. Well, yes. The, yes, go, uh, our, our symbol is a big gooey duck, a clam. Um, it's hard to make an outfit for it. Um, <laughs> but I went to that school, um, they built it in, I, so I started in 74, I think it only began in 1972, and it was a result of the hippies being around for a really long time, and so the, the Washington State Legislature um, said, let's build a college for hippies, and they all went, aye, they did it, and then, but then afterwards, you know, they did, forgot that hippies don't want to go to college, so they were letting anyone in which is how I was able to go to college. <laughs> and um, I always say that my entrance essay was uh, index card, uh, Elmer's glue, peace sign, lentils, full scholarship. Um, so, and there's, and it was there that I met my teacher, Marilyn Prasca, who is still my teacher and who I'm still very good friends with, and who asked me a question. She asked me one question when I was 19 years old. I'm 58 now, and the question was this: What is an image? And that was my task, was to try to understand what this question was, what is an image? And it is one question that has guided my entire life um, ever since then. And I'll just, and the, now I'm just going to give you an example because it's easier to let you know what an image feels like than to explain it. So you all remember your first phone number? Because I'm going to count to three and we're just going to all see our first phone numbers out loud, okay? One, two, three. Three, three, two, five, nine, nine, four. Ooh, that's nice. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three. P A two four four three five. Okay, now your phone number from three phone numbers ago. Oh, I want, forgot to make you look. Because <laughs> what you see is when you ask somebody for three phone numbers ago, you'll see everybody go like this. And um, you'll notice that there's a big difference. One, that first phone number, spontaneous. The other, that I'd say that contains an image. Um, the other one is thinking. In fact, I believe if we were doing a, a functional uh, MRI on your brain, you'd see a completely different signature. The other thing about that first phone number and an image, it feels alive because after you all said your first phone number, you did this. <laughs> and then the people who couldn't remember, you know, social security number, first phone number. So, so I've been tracking this idea of what an image is and Marilyn's idea was that anything that we call the arts, it's that enlivening thing that's contained by anything we call the arts. And in the research I've been doing since then, I would say that um, it's also contained by any um, object that a kid is deeply attached to. So if you think of that blankie, a blankie, it's the first artwork. It really is a piece of cloth, but it contains this other thing, this image. And that our urge to work with images is, pr it's, it's before we can speak for a lot of people by the time. So that's the stuff I've been interested in. And um, at the U University of Wisconsin-Madison, somehow, um, I was, my title, I didn't pick it for myself, was um, I am Assistant Professor in Interdisciplinary Creativity. And my husband just calls me Professor Longtitle. Um, <laughs> 
But my, my hire is a joint hire with the art department and then a branch of, the, of, of, the, of sciences at the UW because I am really interested in approaching this and trying to figure out, because I believe that this stuff does have a biological function. I don't think we would have dragged it through all our iterations of being human and it wouldn't come up immediately when babies are, uh, before they can talk, how they can even dance. Um, so I, I'm, that's the stuff that I'm interested in, is in, because if I can make the case to people that this might have a biological function, then it gets interesting again. If you think, oh, all I'm going to do is make pictures or make a painting so that I can, and then I look at what the trajectory is there so you can what? You know, then you get a, what's the top of it? You know, you get a, you're, at, before you die, you get a retrospective somewhere. But if I think of it as more like our kidneys or our liver, and when people say, oh, I can't draw, my drawing's bad, it's like I want to go, you know, your liver's not that cute either, but <laughs> you want it, you know? <laughs> so that's the, that's, that's the stuff that I'm working on. So you talked to me when, when we talked in 2011, you were just starting to prepare your proposal, I think, for this class that mm -hmm. you were going to do at University of Wisconsin. And one thing you told me then that, it se that seems to be something that stuck throughout is you really had a goal of, yes, of it being interdisciplinary, meaning that you really wanted students from a bunch of different kinds of majors. You wanted writers, you wanted artists, and you wanted scientists. You wanted yeah. science students. Have you been able to get science students to take Absolutely, this class? I have. And, and um, I've been, uh, from people from a, a lot of different disciplines have been able to take the class. And my favorite people are the people who, and I make it clear that you do not have to have any drawing experience before you're in my class. In fact, I like it better if you don't. Um, because for people who quit drawing, like some of you may have, when you're about at about fifth or sixth grade is when people really, the, the bud really closes down. Your drawing style is intact from that time, and which may horrify you a little bit, except for if you go upstairs and look at some of the comics and you realize what an advantage it is. <laughs> um, that drawing style, if I, I love to get people to just, just walk them back into drawing and writing um, with this idea that there might be another purpose um, than to make something great. So it's been amazing um, to work with these students. And now I'm actually, I have um, 12 PhD students from different disciplines. And, um, and, they, uh, and I'm trying to help them write their dissertations, which, you know, if they asked me what my background was in dissertations, it would be index card with lentils. But, um, <laughs> But I'm teaming them up, and they're like mathematicians. Um, somebody's doing their dissertation on overfishing in Uganda, um, gender and women's studies, um, you know, education theory, all this stuff. And I'm teaming them up with four-year-olds as co-research partners. <laughs> and it's so amazing. It's so amazing. Um, so yeah, so I get to do all that stuff until someone stops me. Uh, so right now up on the board I have a page from Syllabus which is uh, some of the drawings of cars that some of the, your students did in that first class. What, and then you also have on the next page you have the other thing you have them draw which is Batman. Batman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I ask people to draw. It's an Ivan Brunetti. By the way, if you're interested in making comics, there is one book that is fantastic. It's Ivan Brunetti's book, um, Cartooning, Philosophy, and Practice. I think it's the best book there is. It's Inky Binky Tiny. But he has an exercise in there where he has people, I have my students just fold a piece of paper into quarters, and then I say, you have two minutes to draw a car, and then one minute to draw a car, and then 30 <laughs> seconds to draw a car, and then 15 seconds. Then I have them fold into thirds, and we do the same thing, except for the end, it's Batman. And in the last panel, you have to draw Batman in five seconds. Well, just, just in our last class, I was having my students, they, they seemed a little bit stiff, and I said, okay, so let's draw Batman in the style of Ivan Brunetti, um, which is, it's basically the kid style, big head, some sort of shape for a body, a uh, geometric shape, and kind of arms that move this, that, this way or that, some rudimentary features. I said, now turn it into Batman. So they did, they were, and then the next one I said, so draw Batman throwing up. No one can make a bad drawing of Batman throwing up. <laughs> Batman throwing up always looks completely amazing. And, um, and then I had them draw a Batman being really dejected and then Batman screaming. And if you, I have a Tumblr page that I keep from my class. It has the whole syllabus on it. It's the nearsighted monkey tumblr.com and last night I just uploaded the pictures of Batman vomiting to some very jolly music and so feel free to see that and you'll go oh, I could do that and it's like yeah you can you actually can who knew we all had that locked in our psyche yeah. Batman 
barfing, vomiting. Barfing Batman. Almost everybody vomiting looks good. Yeah. As a drawing. Yeah. Um, so one Abraham thing, Lincoln. <laughs> Hat falling off. I look forward to a, just a wave of people, bar, of famous people barfing mini comics yeah. in next year's SPX. <laughs> Um, so one thing I really enjoyed in the new book um, is your classroom rules, mm -hmm. the classroom rules for this class. And um, some of them are, I think, rules that are shared with many other teachers. We do not activate any electronic devices in class or use them for our assignments. Um, but there's one thing in here that really brings, um, I, I think, to the fore, one thing that is different about your teaching of writing and creativity from almost everyone else I know who teaches writing and creativity, which is over on the left side in the middle, um, we do not uh, ask who made which picture or wrote which story, and um, we don't give advice or opinions on the work of our classmates. So I think many people who have experience, as I do, in a, in a writing MFA program, for example, are very familiar with a workshop format where someone brings in a story and everyone reads it, and then you mark it up, and then you talk about it for a while, and maybe you're nice to them, or you're, maybe you're mean to them, or whatever, but that is sort of, that's the structure, right? You turn in a piece of work, and then people, your whole class is working together with you to make that piece of work better. Tell me and tell them why, in your teaching, you are to, you're not interested in that step of the sort of traditional write, teaching writing process. Well, yeah, and there's one other thing, too. Um, when, when I, so in my comics class, we write and draw. And in the writing thing, when I have people read, no one's allowed to look at the person who's reading. Oh, right, yes. yeah. Yeah, everyone they has have to look, to actually, you look down and... You have you to draw a spiral. Yeah. You have to just draw a spiral. So the reason I, well, the reason I make it, it's because I learned it from my teacher, Marilyn, who only would say good after something. That's all she'd say. And um, what started to happen was, if you've ever been in a writing class and you know it's time to comment, for me, the only th reason I was going to comment, it wasn't so much about what Dan might have written, it was what can I say that will make the teacher know that I'm really smart and mm -hmm. will get someone else in the room to want to make out with me. <laughs> like, that was it, really. That was my only motivation. And some person, or and if it couldn't be a person, even the plant in the corner, as long as they just look, she is so sensitive, I must have her. But, um, <laughs> So there's something about what happens is when you're not manufacturing a comment, um, one of the things that starts to happen is you stop thinking of any comments and you actually get access to the work. The other thing is when you're um, listening and you're drawing, which is now, thank God, there's so much uh, research that supports doodling while you're listening, um, there's a the research shows that there's a much higher retention of what you're hearing and also a concentration. If some of you may know that our most beautiful Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has uh, knit through every Supreme Court decision, every one, she's knit. And I always imagine she's knitting a full body cozy for Scalia, you know? <laughs> Just keeps holding it up. See if it's not big not enough yet. Not done yet, you know? So, um, there's something, and also there's something about moving your hand while you're listening to somebody else's writing. There's a part of your brain, I mean, I got very interested in how the brain works um, and with mirror cells and all this stuff. There's a part of your mind that can't tell if you're writing the story or not. You're moving your hand and you're listening. So what I'm using my class to do is to make the whole class stronger so that they can continue the work once we're you know, once the sad day comes and our class has to not be together anymore. I'm the only one crying my face off when I'm saying goodbye <laughs> and blocking the door um, so they can't leave. But um, so that's that, yeah, that's one of the things. And I've just found that comments can be very harmful, not very useful, especially because the baby just got there. I mean, this is a, you've just written this piece, right? And you're about to read it out loud. And um, I, I just feel like it's, it's first of all, it's, it's too new to comment on. And then um, also I just feel like it's this very new baby and nobody knows exactly what this story is about. And sometimes, you know, people will finish something. I won't even let my students read over what they've written unless they're going to read it out loud. They can read over it at the end of the semester or they can read it out loud. And I know they sneak, but, um, and I always say it's because the, when you're writing, you're writing in order, you're having an experience. When you're reading it over, you're just trying to figure out, is my baby a genius? 
or is this a really bad baby that I can't put back? <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, and I always think it's because, and people like judge so quickly, particularly with drawing. With drawing, they judge very quickly that it's a, it, they are, it's a bad drawing. And I say it's sort of like saying, well, why is it a bad drawing? It's, if you say it's a bad baby, my baby has no eyes, and my baby has no, has no hands. It's because you didn't wait long enough for the baby to go like this, and then go like this, and then go like this because you said it was a bad baby, you know? <laughs> So I try to get the students to think that about the work being able to see them too. And the work, hopefully, when you come down there with the pen, it's not going, oh, fuck, not this joker again. You know? <laughs> so, so when you think about talking about your work, you th talk up, think about it like it can hear you. And which work is going to come forward if you're just going, oh, this is shitty, this is shitty. I'm not going to date that dude or chick or plant. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my idea. And it seems like it wouldn't work, except for it works for me. And then um, a very good friend of mine who I'm working on a book with, uh, Dan Sean, who's an astonishing writer, um, who teaches creative writing at, at Oberlin, has been trying this out. And it turns out that that workshop method uh, is very good for the top of the mind. It's not very good for the life in your story, that living, that animating force that sort of defies, um, defies being defined. Well, you know, when I was interviewing you, it was at the Miami Writers Conference, and one of the other teachers there was Madison Bell, mm -hmm. who teaches right around here at Goucher College, a, a really excellent writer who lives right around here. Um, and uh, he had not encountered you or, or seen your class before, and he really was, I think, somewhat, he was taken aback and pleasantly surprised by the way that it worked, because it is very against the way that teaching writing often goes and that you are making a specific attempt in these classes to give students ways into their own memory and their own creativity, right? And so you're talking about not just the process of making a piece of writing better, but where that piece of writing comes from in the first place. Well, yeah, and I'm also taking advantage. The only reason that we can write is because we want to. I mean, human beings kind of want to. And I'm taking advantage of this phenomenon that you all have experienced, which is, you know how you're like walking down the street and suddenly you'll smell the smell and it brings back the eighth grade or it brings back your Aunt Martha's kitchen? You know what I'm talking about? If you think about it, and it, it happens to us all day long and we don't really notice it, but we call it a flood, right? So for a second, you're walking and then all of a sudden there's Aunt Martha's basement and then you just continue on. If, for most people, they think, oh, they kind of saw the basement, but it turns out, well, I'll just do it for you. It's easier to do it. So I want you all to think of a car from when you were little, any kind of car, a subway car, anything, but some one car that you were familiar with, okay? So thinking about it, you don't have to answer out loud, but you're thinking about this car, right? Are you inside of the car or outside of the car? You kind of know, right? You know, right? If you're inside of the car, what seat are you sitting in? You know. If you're outside of the car, what part of the car are you facing? What time of day or night is it in this image? What season does it seem to be? You know, right? What the fuck is that? <laughs> what is that? I mean, where was that car sitting? It was sitting next to your phone number. <laughs> um, so it's like taking advantage in that when that memory comes, when you can get a memory to come like that, you can find that people can turn around in it. You can ask them to turn around and say, what's to your right? I can ask you that with this car. What's to your left? What's behind you? And then what starts to happen is this urge to, to write. And then I give people a very specific amount of time to write. And I always tell them when they have three more minutes, because it's like talking on the phone for a friend and you're, you're really excited about telling them the story and you think you have six minutes and then you realize you only have three. Everybody knows how to edit that down to fit into three. So I'm trying to take advantage of the stuff we do all the time, and um, including story structure. I feel like the only reason we can write about story structure is because it already exists, and that we get it backwards when, once we think how we have to learn about writing. And I always tell my students, it's like thinking the only reason that we have teeth is because there are dentists. It's the other way around, you know? So this whole, the reason there's a lot of writing about story structure is because it already exists. And where I find that very, uh, just writ large is um, in uh, working with kids and hearing their stories. Um, that's been, and that's why, why I, I'm teaming up four-year-olds with my PhD students who are just about, I, they couldn't be tighter when it comes time to write a dissertation. Not that I've ever done it, but um, I just, I can tell how hard it is for them. Um, I've got up on the screen a, a basic quick diary format from Syllabus, this book, and it's one of many sort of uh, 
structures and tools that you seem to really enjoy giving your students to help them uh, sort of work out the stories that they want to tell or help them even just sort of build those stories for the future today. Can you talk a little bit about this format and why you think this is better than just sitting down to try and write to a journal To try to day? write a diary. Yeah, yeah, everybody, remember when you first heard about diaries and maybe you started writing them? And I remember I'd get, I had, the first one that I saw was like a little velvet one from the pay and save that had five years on every page. You know, you're supposed to write three sentences about each day and you think, this is going to be amazing. You know, by the time I'm 10, I'll have my whole life. And then you only fill in about four pages, right? And then it happens again. You get another journal, and then God help you, somebody in your family realizes that you might like, and they buy you an expensive one, and then, you, then you're really screwed because you just put your name in it, and you've already screwed it up. Um, so part of the problem with writing a diary is, one, who are we writing it to, and what's it for? And, and I also think that a diary, if you try to keep it in sentences, explaining the whole day, you get tired. So I figured out a way to do a diary, which is to just draw, basically draw this shape. And I have people number from one to seven in each of those columns. And the first thing I ask them to do is, and you can do it right now, from think about when you woke up this morning, and then you write the first in two and a half minutes, or one and a half I start people up, because I don't want the diary to take longer <laughs> than six minutes. Um, so you just write seven things that you did, or seven places that you were today, that you've done. And in each of those places, there was something you saw. And you write down, and it's that kind of seeing that happens when, you know when you're on vacation, like I went to France, and I, I was, oh, I'm in France, I'm in France. And then I came home, and instead of remembering the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, I remembered like this batter on the sleeve of the guy who was making a crepe. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or like, you know, in the restroom, there was a coat hook that looked like it was screaming at me while I was peeing. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like these weird things, and you're going, why am I remembering it? Well, I found that there's a part of you that is taking pictures all day that you don't really know about. It's this other part that's taking pictures all day. So what this diary thing helps you do is it starts to help you notice what you notice. What's the stuff that, that you notice all the time? And then in the last uh, frame, I have people write something that they overheard because that's also good, especially if you want to do comics, to just and also, it'll just make life so much less boring. Like one of the things that I heard that killed me was two, two, <laughs> two male students are walking at the UW, and one of them says, which problem would you rather have? Every time you sneeze, you change gender, or you can't tell the difference between a baby and a muffin. <laughs> I mean, that stuff's going on all day long. People are saying stuff like that all day long. It's the it, great question of our time. It I is, think. it is. It's the, and so what happens is when you hear that, and if you have a place to write it down, what you'll find is you'll hear it, and then you'll repeat it in your head a couple times so you'll remember it so you can write it down. Um, I also was able to write down the response from the other person. The other person said, well, the sneezing part won't be bad because I always sneeze in even numbers. <laughs> He goes, so I guess, but the baby, that, you could spend 18 years raising a muffin. <laughs> <laughs> but there's stuff like that all over, and once you have a place, like, and it's not, once the back of the mind knows that you really are going to, that you really are going to write this down, it will, it will alert you, and then you can switch them up. You can, make, um, seven, you can make it seven things that you heard people say over the day and one, day, one thing that you did. But there's something, what you did during the day, it's sort of that's narrative, right? And, um, and um, something that you saw is the description and then uh, the little thing that you heard, it's dialogue. If you want to frame it in that way that makes you already not want to do it, um, you can. Um, or tell the difference between a baby and a muffin. <laughs> So aside from all the stoned students who you now get to listen to <laughs> walking around, how has, has being in an institution like UW, has that changed your teaching in any way? Has it, have you evolved the class as you've gone along? Um, it's changed my teaching in that, um, well, it's a, I, I only came to do it because I, I had gotten absolutely as far as I could get in my own practice trying to answer this question, what is an image? And I really needed other people to do it, to help me with it. I wanted to see it in action. 
I wanted to see um, what happens if you just ask people to do these things that I've been doing in workshops. My longest workshop prior to teaching at the UW was five days. So I just wanted to see what happens to people, um, and especially what happens if they can't tell who's doing what in class. Like the, the ba Batman barfing uh, assignment that I gave, it was a round robin with non-photo blue pencil. So, uh, so first they had to draw their Batman with a uh, non-photo blue regular Batman. Then they all had to trade, and I make them trade again so they don't know whose drawing they got. But they had to riff off of that one. That's when they had to draw Batman vomiting. And then trade and trade and trade. So in the end, they end up with a piece of paper, four drawings done by four different people in the class in non-photo blue. And then that last person, I give them 20 minutes to ink it. And that's when you see the power of the guy who inks. Because even the people who can't draw still have a line, just in the same way they have a voice, a sound to their voice. And so when that person inks it, somehow it looks like it was done by one person. So that's the stuff that I can't do on my own and I can't find out on my own. Um, so yeah, I like it and I love and I have a lab, like I actually have a lab and I wear a lab coat all the time because no one tells me to stop. And, um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's just phenomenal to be in the, the building that I work in, it's the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. And um, so the first floor is public, but on the upper three floors are all this, like the heaviest science stuff that's going on. And one of the things that I'm very fascinated with and sad about is the loss of handwriting. Some of you may know that cursive is no longer being taught and handwriting instruction goes to only the second grade. There's no instruction in stroke order or anything. So that's all gone and I'm, I'm just like bemoaning it and bemoaning it and bemoaning it and then I go upstairs, the scientists are totally still doing handwriting, the whiteboards. And they wait, the way they designed that building was they want to encourage people to write so every surface is meant to be written on. And I started to find these astonishing, you know, their drawings and, and formula. And I noticed that they had the same characteristic of um, kids who were probably um, under the age of third grade, from about, I'd say, from four till, four till about maybe seven, um, had that same quality. And that's a, that's a quality we call childish, but I think it's what a line looks like when somebody's getting an idea. When somebody's getting an idea, it, the line is really different, and it's different than rendering. And you see it in cartooning. Cartooning is a perfect example of being able to see that kind of free line. But these scientists, I go to their seminars, even though I don't know what they're talking about. It's like, we're gonna implant some kind of gene that makes this fruit fly's butt glow. Um, <laughs> but they're like explaining it. And then they suddenly have to draw a person and they just go like this and they look at me. And I was like, I just tell them, don't do a stick man. I'm mean, stick man, it seems like it's the fastest way to do a drawing. It's not, it's, uh, it's I always say, if you don't do it just right, it always has a dinger, which you might want. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but the Ivan Brunetti style, which is based on, um, on children, you all could do it. It's just a circle, again, with a geometric shape. And then instead of having arms that are straight, you give them just a little bit of a wiggle. And from there, uh, I found that if my students start there, without them knowing it, their drawing turns into their very own drawing. And they're always shocked at the end of the semester because they still think they're drawing in Ivan Brunetti style, but it looks nothing like it anymore. It's theirs. Um, when yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good. <laughs> when you um, talk to the scientists at the university and people say, well, what do you teach, what do you say? Um, I, t I say I teach people who really want to draw to start drawing again. And what's weird is they all come down to my lab. My lab's on the first floor. It faces University Avenue. I always have crazy stuff hanging in the windows. And they come down and they have this longing. It's a very strong longing. I have one guy, amazing, he's a world-renowned bacteriologist. And he comes down to my um, studio, I mean down to the lab, and he says, uh, he comes down to talk to me about graphic representation, um, how, how do you uh, show time it graphically? And the reason is because, you know, these guys have to show um, these, they have to make these posters, that's, that's how science is done now at these fairs. So they have to show, his, his interest was in contagion. So he had to show, a picture of, of these cells and the bacteria um, mixing with them and then contagion happening, happening over time. And he said the problem is that in the West, you know, we think that time goes from left to right, and, but these posters are read by people all over the world, so they can't just represent time that way. And he gave me an example. He goes, 
uh, he goes, for example, there was an ad for Coca-Cola that was left to right, and it showed uh, a man being tired, drinking a Coca-Cola, and then being refreshed. But in Arabic countries, <laughs> it told the truth about Coke. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> Anyway, so he comes down with that question, but it turns out in his pocket, he had this piece of paper, and maybe you guys will remember this. It usually happens to fifth graders where they try to draw something and it's not right, and they erase it and draw it and erase it until the paper just looks like it's just been, and it was a tiny drawing. All he wanted to do was draw a cell wearing a ninja scarf. <laughs> that was it, it's five lines, and you could tell that he was like, oh, and he didn't even want to show it to me, and when I saw it, I almost started crying. And so he's from, um, He's from India, and I, he heard me talking about these drawing jams that I had for kids. And he goes, I think you should have, you know, a, a drawing gym for scientists. He thought I said drawing gym, which is now what we're doing in the lab. It's called the drawing gym. <laughs> Try this. <laughs> uh, I would love for you to have a, just a, an all-professor drawing gym at yeah. some point. I feel like they, you... Well, that's the question I say. is like, why does the longing persist? And even if you say to someone, if I could give you the power to draw anything you want, but the caveat is you can never, ever make any kind of profit from it, would you take that power? Most people would. Yeah. And I say, why? Why? I used to think it was so people would make out with me, because that was only my driving force when I was younger, but, um, and still today and all of you right now. But... Um, <laughs> But it is an interesting question. The same thing with singing. If you could sing but never make any profit from it at all, would you take that? And most people would. So if you would, the answer, the good news is you can. You can. Um, and, uh, but if I frame it about it, it having some biological function, some, some other function other than making something that, is, that other people can tell is good, then people have a way to get interested in it again. Do you find um, in this class, you know, I feel like when you do one or two day workshops, often there will be someone in the class who just doesn't buy into the method or who is just not into it and that, or it causes problems in the class and you, know, you can deal with that in a one or two day workshop. In dealing these, doing these full semester classes, have you found that there are students who, though they signed up for the class, are resistant to following those rules or doing the things that they need to do in order to get the most out of the class? You know, they, those people identify themselves to themselves pretty quickly, like mm -hmm. I'd say within the first or second class, and they drop. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned not to go after them anymore. I used to chase them and right. say, look, just give it one more try, baby. <laughs> I know we can make this work. Um, <laughs> but I also run the class in such a, I mean, some people, it seems like, like, you're, like I'm kind of free, and you've seen me do it. It's a boot camp. I mean, I'm like, really, really strict without trying to I be believe strict. you told the class I saw that you were going to work them like mules on the Erie Canal. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I do. I make people work, and I make it so no one can chat, um, because I think chatting will break that frame of mind. I also determine where they sit in the classroom, um, and so they have these name tags. They also can't use their real names in the class. They all have to pick names. Last, <laughs> and I, last semester, I was Professor Chewbacca. And they all had to call me that, and they got completely used to calling me Professor Chewbacca. Um, this year I'm Professor, Bo I mean this year I'm Professor Bootsy. Um, when I taught my brain class, everyone had the, uh, the different name of a, of a brain, and w by the middle of the semester it was very normal to say, yeah, I, I, I saw hippocampus and limbic system at Corpus Callosum's party. You know, it was like <laughs> completely... So I try to keep it so you can't pick where you're going to sit, who you're going to sit next to. And once I start to know the personalities, I actually do sort of manipulate who's going to sit by who. So by the end of the class, after the first week, we get to know each other really well, but it's never through chatting. It's always through the, through the work itself, through the images. And that, that comes from my teacher, Marilyn, who um, has the opposite uh, way of teaching. She's a much quieter person, but I really understood the power of that and also not checking um, your electronic devices, which is very difficult for young people. Very, very difficult. I give them a 10 minute break and I say, don't check, don't just go pee and come back. And then of course I go out and I see them and I go right up to them and they're like horrified, you know, and like, and I say, yeah, if I ever catch you again, you know. <laughs> because they don't really understand that just that little check of that little thing totally breaks whatever this, this very fragile um, connections that they're starting to form um, in relationship to their own work and relationship to the work of others. 
It's a good thing that college students have a relentless drive to um, have sex with each other because otherwise your class is like a huge collegiate boner killer. Like I feel like it's really hard. Wrong. It really, is, it it's is happening. a huge collegiate boner. All right, good. It is. <laughs> it's the Thank giant. Goodness. And clit. Goodness. Thank goodness. Because we got to speak up. Yeah. Ladies. Um, Not visible, but so there. Extremely important. Um, there's a page in the book where you talk about uh, hate crayon. There's you as Professor Chewbacca mm -hmm. there. Um, where you talk about in one of your classes a thing that, you've, that you traditionally have had all your classes to do, which is to do a lot of coloring in crayon over the course yeah, of the first few classes. Do, yeah, they have to do three three pieces, three color, uh, so I give them crayons and I give them um, coloring pages and they have to do three. In, in the past, I would always tell them, my only uh, guide to you is spend time on it. You'll be graded on how much time you spend on it. Um, and then, is this a story? Right, and so about? yeah, so it seems like at one point, one, for one of your classes, people just, be, it just began to like not work. People were not into the society. No, it's because I screwed up. Instead of saying spend time on it, what I thought is, oh, I'll help them understand um, how to get an A. And I said, get as much crayon as you can onto the page. Just that, that little bit of instruction told them how to do it. And so they all went crazy. I don't know if you've used crayons in a long time. It's very cruel that we give them to children. They're the worst possible mm -hmm. materials. Um, uh, but uh, when people were doing that, they started to hate it. In the past, I, people always loved the assignment, and this particular year, that was last year, they started to really hate it. And I had to go back and think, what had I done? What had I done that was different? And, that's, and I was able to track it back to that. I told them how to do it, instead of just saying spend time on it. So, yeah. Why do you think there's value in things that, in manual activities that people have to really spend time on like that, or you have people use do you know fill in big blacks with very thin lined pens like what do you think is the value of that kind of activity in in, in this structure well for in particular for very for younger people the original digital devices aren't used very often anymore here they are check them out wireless biofueled <laughs> you get two um, so their um, their hands aren't very strong and, um, so, and people don't write by hand very much, so their hands aren't very strong, so part of it is to get their hands stronger. The other thing is while they're coloring, I assign them different things to listen to. Um, I actually ask them to color one um, page where they're in public, which is horrifying for them because people are seeing them coloring and they, you know, they just want to die. Um, and that's sort of been fa fascinating. And then I have them um, color in a, in a social situation with friends um, who, their friends always all want to color. And then the last one is um, listening to something. Uh, this week, the, they're listening to um, an interview with Art Spiegelman um, that was from the 80s when Mouse first came out. And then this beautiful interview with Ray Bradbury um, toward the end of his life, uh, talking about why we do this thing, why we make stuff. And so what they're doing, and I know from the research, this whole thing of as they're coloring, it's helping them listen and helping them retain. And the theory behind that, one of the theories is, when you're bored and you can't do stuff with your hand and so you have to look interested, I hope some of you might be bored and looking interested right now as I'm looking at you. Um, while you're looking interested, you're spacing out. But you only notice it when you space back in. It's sort of like when you're driving and you realize, did I pass the exit? What? You're like, you really, where was I? And God help anyone in the car because I have no idea where I was. There's, um, there's an idea that doing something actually keeps you in the same spot and keeps you listening, so you don't, you don't space out. Um, another thing that seems tied to this in some way to me is this notion that you, that you have in this class and that I saw in the class that I witnessed too, which is the importance of memorization. Not only you have people memorize poems, a lot of several Emily Dickinson poems that you have people memorize, but also this notion that in our heads right now, we have a huge amount of material memorized. And you know, I find this to be true when some song comes on from 1985, and I haven't heard it since then, but it turns out I still know all the words. Yeah. Um, what role do you think that this plays in this class and, and in creativity, this ability that the human mind has to suck in these things without you even knowing about them? Well, I think, it's, I think for somebody who is tasked with memorizing a poem, most people feel horrified by that idea, you know, to memorize a poem. And then I talked to them. It was, it was, a, it was from an exercise uh, I did with Marilyn, which is we were supposed to memorize a poem 
every week. And I was like, how the hell am I going to do that? She goes, well, the poems you already have in your head count. I go, I don't have any poems in my head. We're having beefaroni. It's made with macaroni. Beefaroni is fun to eat. Beef, you know, if you read it like a poetry, beef aroni is fun to eat. Um, so what you find is that people have all these, and so one of the assignments I give them is, I forget for however many minutes, I have them write down everything that they have in their head that, they, that they've memorized, um, and let it go from one thing to the other, and then I have them type it up and email it to me, and I put it all together, um, and then I have, uh, when, they, when they come back to class and they're drawing, I hit uh, text to speech. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hot dogs, armor, hot dogs. What kind of kids eat armor, hot dogs? Fat kids, skinny kids, kids who climb on rocks. Um, and the rest of you know what the words are, right? Tough kids, sissy kids. Um, so, so just having them, and we all just like die laughing over, um, you know, how it'll go from that to the, you know, words about uh, that shaft. No one understands him but his woman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and mostly in advertising, too. There's a lot of advertisers. The advertisers really understand the power of putting um, words to song. So that's how I memorize my poems is to um, music. And I gave the example of Emily Dickinson. Um, the cadence in Emily Dickinson fits so many things. Um, uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, Girl from Ipanema. I fell to cleaving in my mind as if my brain had split. Or uh, California Girls. Um, uh, I fell to cleaving in my mind as if my brain had split. <laughs> or um, or uh, Gershwin. I fell to cleaving in my mind as if my brain had split. I tried to match it seam by seam but could not make it fit. When you just see this cadence, <laughs> this cadence just completely hooks up with these other things, then you start to think, well, what's going on here? And um, so I found that if I can get them, and then there's brain stuff about uh, melody and poetry um, being more, I call it the back of the mind. I don't, I think, I like back of the mind and top of the mind because they're not spatially opposite of each other. Um, so when, they, when people start to find those little things, it's always like a joy and a shock, and it's a, a very quick way to remember stuff. There's also a poem I always recite through the entire, um, the entire year, and I tell them in the beginning, you'll hear this poem over and over again, don't try to concentrate on it, but by the end of the class, you'll be able to recite it, and they can. They can all recite it by the end of the class. So that's, again, I'm just taking advantage of what we normally do, and what advertisers know about us, too. You talk a lot in all these books um, about the sort of innate creativity that kids have and the way that kids have real access to the image world. Do you, in Madison ever, do you teach kids? I do. I have um, the first Saturday of every month, I host a drawing jam at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. Oh, a drawing, a drawing, a drawing jam. jam. Yeah. No, this is a drawing jam oh, sorry, for sorry. the kids, gym for the Got adults. It. Because uh, the jam's too scary for the adults, <laughs> and the kids, why would they go to a gym? Um, but uh, so what I do is I, uh, so usually that, it's, it's called Saturday Science, and there's usually a theme. And so what I do is I um, ask these kids very complicated, well, complicated questions. Hold it, there's some secrets. Well, sorry, the, like right now. Mm -hmm. We have to get out of the room? Why do I have to make that announcement? Oh, what happened, tell me, I'll make it. We have to have an emergency evacuation. This is exciting. Yeah, let's see. Uh oh. Well, good, first of all, open the fucking door. Yeah. Because <laughs> if mean, we gotta go, let's open those doors. Yeah. Open them. Yeah, open it up. I'm going to see what's going on. Seems like if it was a real emergency, they maybe would have made the announcement themselves. Somebody's check bounced. That's what it was. Sorry, if you're an attendee in row E, all your checks bounced. Linda's going to take care of it, guys. Please report back, Linda. What's going on? All right. 
All right. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but um, let's go out. Let's get out of here. Just scary. <laughs> let's just get out of here.